Um, yeah, we look at uh, if you look at level of sports, you look at endurance types or explosive uh, sports uh, types. Extreme 100 meter run and marathon run is the two extremes that we have in one sport in, the, in, the, in track and field at least. It's very easy to see that the muscle fiber type is different in, in, in both. Number two, it's easy to see that the cardiac system is uh, completely different. It's the size of the, of the wall of the heart and the left ventricle uh, wall or, uh, or the, 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 the volume of the heart, it doesn't really matter, it's different. Um, there is differences in personality and personality mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. Have you seen Usain Bolt? Well, you know, he's a different personality from the average marathon runner, who is a boring, dull person. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> 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 what do you say? Sprinters are never dull, believe me. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, 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 just kidding. Um, so, the temperament and the personality of a sprinter are different from... Uh, from you can also find it back in the... In the as a matter of fact, uh, an article has been written in Russia about uh, looking at uh, basically, basically these parameters in DC potential in different kind of sports, in explosive, in endurance, and in mixed sports. And that you perfectly find this pattern that the HRV is, uh, is lower in sprinters, and more have a higher sympathetic. And also the regulation is different. So that means I will that want to add to that after you finish. Sorry? I would like yeah. to add to that yeah. after you finish. And you always find in endurance uh, athletes, uh, most of the time, a higher vagal system, that's number one. Uh, sometimes too high of a vagal system. And in sprinter you seldom find it because they don't make the mileage, they don't make the hours. They're kind of lazy, so they don't have the higher intensity, they have a very low volume. So they don't have the time to develop a higher vagal system. And they don't like slow stuff in the first place. I know, you like the slow stuff. <laughs> yeah, you know? yeah. There's one indication, it could be the resting heart rate already. Sprinters are always uh, over 60, mainly. The real 100 meter runners and the 60 meter runners. And uh, for an endurance athlete to be over 60 is quite exceptional. Uh, or at least under 60, if they're really good under, under uh, 50. And the world's best have under, under, under 40 and even under 30. So 28 has a resting heart rate. Uh, that of course causes a danger, so some of them sleep with a heart rate monitor. So if it goes below 30, it starts to beep and then they go out and, uh, and they uh, exercise a little bit. Because there's a certain danger, you know, if your heart stops uh, one beat and it's four seconds without uh, blood pumping uh, through your, uh, to your brain. So that's a certain risk in uh, extreme endurance uh, sports. You know, some people die from that. Yeah, yeah so... At least in Russia, where the system comes from, uh, it's uh, originally is, uh, is basically is this research has already been done. So the typology based on, on, on autonomic and on uh, cardiac and on uh, on uh, uh, central nervous system uh, parameters. I have it. I don't know where it is, but I I have it in my uh, on my hard disk. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and it's not true. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I know. I know. I know. So, I know. I know. I know. Uh, <coughs> It's true, and not only in Russia, there were lots of research done that claims that endurance athletes have much higher, they are primary uh, parasympathetically dominant, mm -hmm. and sprinters primary sympathetically dominant. Nothing is further from the truth, because it all sounds great until you actually start having enough data and looking at it, right? So, uh, I have data especially in like early 2000s, of the best explosive athletes in the world, world record holders, uh, world champions, Olympic champions, anywhere from Maurice Green, Otto Bolden, uh, John Gudina, shot putter, uh, marathon Ol Olympic medalists. One common thing across all of them, high vagal tone. Recovery. Very high vagal tone. In fact, you will find it in explosive outlets sometime even higher than the norm. So parasympathetically dominant, highly parasympathetically dominant. So that's the one thing. And then we did our own experiment again. Uh, we never published it. Maybe Roman will find time eventually to do it. But we tested back to that same population, 160 or 180 outlets during Olympic trials in the United States. And we didn't, uh, it was all sprinters, middle distance, throwers, whoever came through our room, we tested them. 
And the data was published by Duke University, but their desire was a little bit different than ours. So they only compared athletes versus non-athletes. Mm -hmm. And they came with conclusion, yes, athletes have much higher vagal tone than non-athletes. But we already knew that. That was nothing new. Uh, at the time, we didn't have uh, scientists on the team. So I just asked my engineer, sat down with him and created a different profile. So we looked at, so we have omega wave data. Now we looked what result athletes show during Olympic trial. Then we look at what was their personal best during this season and what was their overall time personal best. Mm -hmm. So we wanted to see what percentage of their personal best they achieved during Olympic trials. And it was very apparent. People who showed vagal regulation above 0 0.3, but not higher than 0 0.45, were more likely, regardless of event, <clears throat> achieve closer result to their season best. Assuming all the other parameters were fine. Because if you see, we only selected the people that were also equal on all the other parameters. So uh, you're absolutely correct. There is research published, mm -hmm. but our own observation leads us to believe that might not be the case. There's two things, however. There's two things to... to okay. well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 stay, stay, stay. stay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we can discuss this. Number one. They were American athletes. And you know the American track and field competition is the highest level of competition in the world. Even if you come sixth in the US trials, in the Olympics you might still be third. Your time might be better than the third one in the Olympics or fourth one in the Olympics. Because it's the highest level. So you're dealing with genetically exceptional people. That's number one. Number two, you're dealing with athletes which have a very high level of training uh, for quite a, quite a few years. So not people who came on stage uh, Last year, no, there might, might have been uh, six to eight years of very high level training uh, and very high volume training as well, as a matter of fact. So, high intensity, but also a high volume of that. Otherwise, they wouldn't make it through the US uh, 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 to the tr trials in the first place and they wouldn't make it through the trials. Number three, high vagal tone is logically, because the high vagal tone is the regulation of, let me say, nervousness or con controlling your adrenaline levels or the sympathetic level as well. So if you, I did test at the European Championships, track and field in Munich, testing athletes every day, sprinters every day, and then you see uh, there's an optimum there, like <laughs> there always there's an optimum there. And uh, when the vagal tone was at the lowest, there was the worst results. And the vagal tone was uh, too high, there was no results at all because uh, uh, there was no need to uh, to uh, to uh, to uh, perform. So in a relaxed uh, state, yeah, that's uh, the is, we, we observe the same thing. Yeah. Fourth complicating factor is uh, the use of medication to yeah. improve your performance as well, <laughs> which could that, uh, be in a normal population a little bit less than at the Olympic trials. I believe they've been there as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you don't know what the, what the effect of taking drugs is on the on the autonomic systems of kind of we know. Huh? It's but it's perfect actually, adaptogen, let me yeah, say Yeah, that. that, that's true. Uh, <coughs> now, we can eliminate probably that assumption, yeah. not in this case, but you know. for many years I was involved also living in Eugene, Oregon, mm -hmm. where it's a mecca of track and field. I was involved with uh, what we call veterans competition, mm -hmm. right? In fact, lots of our initial <coughs> research we did on that population. It's people anywhere after 45 who still compete in the World Games. And we did the same thing. So we measured long distance runners, whoever came for competition, it didn't matter. Right? And we actually observed the same results as we observed in the Olympic trials, the primary Olympic trials in the United States. We found that even older population, including all the way to 90s, because there were lots of people performing in their 80s, will still show much higher, regardless of event, they could be sprinters or throwers even like javelin throw. Just because they did physical activity, they would show much higher vagal tone than their couch potato uh, same age population. So in other words, physical yeah. <laughs> any physical activity, assuming it's applied, applied properly, will increase vagal tone.
And it doesn't matter if it's explosive activity or power activity or endurance activity, but the key word is only if applied properly.